and bow before your throne of grace that you know the needs of every individual name that's on this list the many many names that are here those are are struggling with with cancer and and serious uh, uh, illnesses sicknesses diseases god those that are still at home recovering from either having had surgery or not really completely over uh, an illness and sickness those who have lost loved ones like the the street family um, father so many needs that are here and we lift them up to you you know every hair of our heads and that's your way of telling us that you know every intimate detail of our lives and you are the great physician and we pray for these we lift them up to you bring your help you are jehovah rapha and you are god who heals so we pray your healing power and grace for every need Lord, we lift up those that that are unspoken requests and things that are heavy on our hearts we may not have mentioned publicly tonight but father you know the things that are concerning to us maybe personal issues and, and loved ones uh, family relationships other kinds of needs that we have in our lives and when they're heavy on our heart god i pray that you will answer the cry of our heart before you i pray lord for those who are preparing for for works of ministry uh, for mission uh, mission work like we're planning for our alaska trip and i pray for those who are on that list to participate in the, the trip to alaska this summer to, to work with um, the first baptist church in palmer i pray that you will bless in in traveling mercies bless in uh, in, in health bless in, in bringing together all the the financial needs and everything that needs to take place in order to make this trip happen Lord, for so many other things, we lift all of these requests up to your throne of grace. We, we give you praise and glory for the names that, uh, of those that we've asked uh, or we've said praise over tonight because of, of an answered prayer. And we pray that you would bless in the families that names that we've removed because they have uh, passed. Lord, I pray that you'll bless those families with your, with your compassion and care. Father, now as we enter into a time of study of your word let it be uh, not just informative to us not just uh, a bible lesson but lord let us see the application of your word let it seep deep into our soul and may it have a transforming work in our heart that we would be more like jesus and that we would be faithful servants in your kingdom in jesus name amen all right so the book of revelation <clears throat> as we study the book of revelation over the next however long it takes to study the book of Revelation. <laughs> Can we just put it that way? I'm not trying to put a, you know, a timeline on this and say, you know, we're going to do this in eight weeks or we're going to do this in whatever number of weeks. I just, I feel like if we can just walk through the book together and, and not just hit the highlights, of course, we'll do that and answer the big questions, but there's some stuff to wade through here and there, there's some depth that we want to uh, be part of our lives because there's a, a promise associated with the book of Revelation. Does anybody know what that is? What is it? Blessed for having read it and heard it and applied it there's a blessing and we're going to read that in just a moment it's right here in chapter one but first of all let's just talk about um, this book as a as a book of the bible uh, there are um, 
historical background, there, there's important information that we need to know to kind of wrap our minds around what's going on in the world in the day in which Revelation was, uh, was written. Um, why does it say some of the things it says and, and how it says and some of the symbolic language in which it says? It, um, so it, it helps us to know that, of course, it, Revelation being a, you know, in the Word of God, it's written to believers. But I believe all of scriptures is not only for the believers, it obviously is, but it's also for the world at large because the world needs to know what's in here. So they'll turn to Christ. I've described the book of Revelation really with two words. When I'll talk about it sometimes, I'll talk about it's a, it's a source of, of blessing and, and it's a source of, of curse. <laughs> It has a promise, and it has a warning. And so, for the believer, there's great promise in the book of Revelation, right? If you read it to the end, guess what? We win, but not because of us, because he wins. So, God wins the whole deal, and those who are his get in on that victory. Um, but it's also a word of warning. They're a word of warning to the believers that we need to live every day as if this may be our last. His coming, Scripture says, is soon. And we're going to talk about that word in just a minute. So there's a word of, of blessing, of promise, of encouragement to the believer and there's a word of warning to the believer, especially when we get into the, the seven churches of Asia Minor in chapters 2 and 3. There's lots of words of warning there. Get, in, get back on track, Jesus says, to at least five of those seven churches. There's some things that well, you really need to work on because you're, you've gotten off track from where I want you to be. And so we'll look at those things. And, of course, to... Uh, the majority of those churches, I believe there was only one church in there where Jesus literally did have something positive to say about it. We'll, we'll get to that. Um, if not next week, uh, it'll be a couple weeks when we are really digging in there. So, to the believer, encouragement, promise, blessing, but also some words of warning. But to the unbelieving world, there's a big red flashing warning sign. Have you ever seen one of those? What does that mean? Like danger. You know, if, if you're driving down the road and there's a big warning sign in the middle of the road, bridge out, you know, something to that effect. What, what, is, what do you think that sign's trying to tell you? You're going in the wrong direction. It's time to do something different than what you're doing right now because something really bad is about to happen. So Revelation is a book to the unbelieving world. It's a big red flashing sign that says there's a warning here. And if you keep going the way you're going, things are not going to go well for you. But it's also a word of promise. Because all of Scripture is still the promise of God that there is redemption. I love the word redemption, right? We are the redeemed in Christ. What does redemption mean? It means God did something to, to buy us back, to purchase us back. Isn't that what redeem means? To redeem is to buy back, to get back. And, and of course, we know that Christ in his blood is the price of redemption. It's what Jesus did on the cross. And so the message to the world is a message of hope that there is redemption, there is, there's hope, there, there's life eternal, if you will, do what the Word of God says. Turn to Christ. And, and that word, um, the word repent literally means that, right? I, I think we know that, right? Repent, the, the word in the original Greek is a word that means do it about face, do it 180, you're going in one direction, you needed to be going in that direction. And so you need to do a 180 in your life. Repent, turn from the direction you're headed away from God and turn to Him. That's what repentance means. Back in the day, 
any of you ever heard of a, of a preacher? And this, this uh, evangelist goes way back to, uh, you know, probably like the 1920s and 30s. It was an evangelist by the name of Billy Sunday. You ever heard of Billy Sunday? Billy Sunday was an incredible athlete. He, in fact, he was a professional baseball player back in the day. And uh, Billy Sunday would do a thing on, on stage. And I'm not going to try it. I won't do it, but. But Billy, would, he, would, he would get on one end of the stage and he'd start running and, and, and he'd, he'd do a big stop and do a big old backflip up in the air and hit the ground facing the other way and, and run the other way. And he'd say, that's repentance. <laughs> that's what repentance looks like. And so I'm not going to illustrate that for you tonight. But just, you know, imagine in, in your mind me, you know, doing a backflip and heading in the nose. Okay. So you know, that's the hope of the world. There is, there is redemption. There is a promise. There is peace. There is the love of God. All of that that's waiting for those who will repent of their sin, turn to Jesus, receive him as Lord and Savior. So let's talk about the book in and of itself. Uh, Revelation is, uh, of course, the last book of the 66 books of the Bible, of course, it's the last book of the 27 books of the New Testament. And because it was the last book written, um, and, and it, has, um, it has as its contents the idea of what we call the, uh, in theology, we call it eschatology. The eschatology. Uh, what does that crazy sounding word mean? Well, it comes from a Greek word that, that talks that the eschaton is the the last things, the the things of the end times is, is literally what that word means. And so when we talk about revelation, we're talking about things of eschatology. But there's another word that Greek word that's used in the text itself, and, and it has to do with the word that we call um, the English equivalent is apocalypse you've heard the word apocalypse before right uh, apocalypto is the greek word and and it's kind of used a little bit different when we think of the word apocalypse what comes to mind bad stuff chaos right the end of things and a you know just a, a big ball of fire um and that's really not what the word means in and of itself. We'll talk about it in just a second. So who is the, uh, the writer of Revelation? Is uh, the Apostle John. And, and I'm not going to get into a lot of the, uh, the scholastic debates that happen about the, who wrote Scripture and is it reliable and this and that. Bottom line for me is, this is the word of God. It says John, <laughs> the apostle, wrote it, and I'm okay with that. So that, that's where I leave that kind of stuff. Um, so we're, when I say we're going to dig in, it's not going to be a lot of that kind of stuff. I just want to know what does the word of God say? And how does it impact our lives? I'm not going to do some, some deep theological treaties on all of this. I just want us to know what is God saying to them a couple thousand years ago, and what is he saying to us today? Because it's one and the same. It's the same thing. What God has said, he has said to them then, and he is saying to us today, he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. In fact, it's right here in our text. We're going to read in just a second. So Revelation is uh, this, the, the name of the book. Now, some of your Bibles, particularly if you have, say, uh, what in, in theological circles we call the AV or the authorized version. Uh, most people just call it the King James. Um, it will say maybe at the top of your page, uh, the revelation of St. John. That's not in the text anywhere. Those headings and even the names of books or editions that scholars made over the years as these books were compiled and then ultimately put together in what we call the canon of Scripture. When I talk about the canon of Scripture, 
uh, in, in theology, we talk about the cannon being closed. That does not mean we have a big gun and we put a stopper in the end of it, <laughs> right? I mean, when you think of cannon, okay, well, we're going to shoot in cannonballs? No. Uh, the, uh, in theology, a cannon is a collection of books, and that's what our Bible is, right? From Genesis to Revelation, you've got 66 separate books. They have been canonized, which means that they have been bound together and said, this is the Word of God. And we're not going to add anything else to it. And we're not going to take anything away from it. Because there's a warning in Revelation about doing some of that stuff too, right? So this is, the, the canon of Scripture is closed. There's no more revelation for, for God to reveal anything else to anybody other than what is in this book. Now, I hear sometimes somebody will say, I got a revelation from God. And my first thought is, okay, if it lines up with, with what's in here, I'm good with that. Because you're actually not getting a revelation as much as you're getting an illumination. of The Holy, the Holy Spirit is illumining, lighting up some fact of the Word of God in you to, to, to kind of reveal something. So the word in and of itself, revelation, uh, we're going to talk about uh, that word, um, apocalypse, that is in the outline in just a second. So we'll, I, I'm trying to hold back on some things that, 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 that we'll get to. So when is the, so we talked about the writer, and that's going to come up in, in just a minute again. Uh, we, we've talked about the, the name, or we're talking about the name Revelation. And by the way, in, in any of your Bibles, do you see an S on the end of that word? So it is not the book of Revelations. Just saying, okay. I mean, I, I just hear people say that. Well, turn to the book of Revelations. That's not in my Bible. I don't have one of those. I have the book of Revelation, singular, because it is the or the revelation, the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's the very first verse. So singular. Um, so the, the, the title is singular, written by John, written where? I think a lot of us know that, answer that question. On the island of Patmos where John, the last remaining living apostle at that time, and he would have been at least in his 80s by the time that he was given the revelation on the island. And he was there, and he's going to, in, in a real short way, he, he tells why he was there in just like one verse. He says, I was there because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. In other words, he was... He was banished. He was exiled uh, to this island because of the preaching of the gospel. At that time, the um, Christian church had already endured a number of, of Roman emperors. Some of you may remember the, the name Nero, one of the worst of those uh, uh, emperors of Rome, the Caesars. And, uh, and, and Nero had, you know, Christians killed by the thousands. Um, Rome burned and he blamed the Christians. He, he set it on fire and blamed the Christians. So some bad things. But that's not the emperor who was in place at the time of the writing of Revelation. It was Domitian. The Caesar or the emperor Domitian. Now, some things are extra biblical that we may share from time to time. And what I mean by extra biblical is their, their history. Histories, uh, sometimes we, in theology, we refer to uh, books like the, the writings of Josephus to help us line up some of the historical facts because he was a Jewish historian 
uh, Josephus was, and, and so his writings were, were accurate to the day in which he was living, which was this time frame during the first, first century. And so sometimes we, we look back in history and we try to find those, those places that line up with Scripture uh, and help us to, to put into place the, the historical um, landmarks along the way that line up with what we know from, from other historians. So, extra-biblical um, history, ch- some church historians, suggest that John was, was going to be executed. He was the last, the, all the other disciples, apostles, now, disciple, I, I, and please forgive, if I use that word interchangeably, Disciples and apostles are one and the same, but they're not. <laughs> Everybody can be a disciple of Jesus. So we're all disciples, but there's, there are only 12 apostles. And then, of course, Judas and, the, and then uh, Matthias you know, took his place. So there, there's 12 apostles, every one of them, beginning with James, the brother of John, was the first of the martyrs, according to the book of Acts. And all of them had suffered a martyr's death, including the Apostle Paul, who would have been number 13 on the list. And the last of the apostles was Paul. So all of them are gone by a martyr's death. And here's John left, and and he's preaching in Ephesus. Domitian, like a lot of the other emperors, wants to be worshipped. You got to bow down and and burn incense in a form of worship to Domitian to declare his divinity. This Roman emperor, he's a god, and everybody in the Roman Empire would do that for him. Did we have a word on? Definitely sounds like a stroke. We will continue to, to, to pray. Um, thank you for, for the update. I, I knew you had gotten a phone call and, and left and come back. So thank you for that. With, um, with Domitian, um, church historians have said that when Domitian wanted to... Uh, to put John to death, that they put his body in a, a vat of boiling oil. But it didn't kill him. And, um, and since it didn't kill him, um, he just decided to banish him. Now, whether or not you know, that part of it's true or not, again, it's extra biblical. It's some of the early church history. Um, it, it's not listed in Scripture anywhere, but that's just kind of a for, in, for your information and how John ends up on the island of Patmos. So Domitian, if, if he can't kill him, he was going to at least kill his message. If I can't kill him, I'll make sure nobody else can listen to him. We'll, put, we'll banish him to an island. And so that's what happened. Well, guess what, Domitian? <laughs> John has been heard loud and clear for 2,000 years. You can't silence the Word of God. And that's what the devil's been doing since the Garden of Eden, right? Silence the Word of God. Well, so here's John exiled, banished to this desolate island off the coast of Ephesus in the, uh, the Aegean Sea. And um, Jesus shows up. So we're just going to dig in now to, to the message. But let's, let's talk before we dig into to verse 1. Let's just talk about the outline. Because if we jump all the way to verse 19 of chapter 1. In many of your Bibles, what color are those letters? They're what color? Red, which means 
the words of Jesus. So now Jesus himself is speaking. This is the, uh, the um, ascended back you know, to heaven, Jesus, who has now come to make a personal appearance and, and speak to, uh, to John. Now, that's not the only one that, the only way that John gives is sometimes it's through an angel. And, and then sometimes it's through Christ himself. So it's kind of just back and forth uh, w- within the revelation. Sometimes it's, a, it's an angel or multiple angels. And then sometimes it's the Lord himself. And sometimes, and we're going to find this out a little bit later on, sometimes it is the Lord who at first John thinks is an angel. And then he, then later it, no, no that's Jesus. And then sometimes because that stuff kind of happens, John sees an angel and, and bows down to worship. And then the angel says, no, 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 <laughs> I'm just an angel. Worship the Lord. So even John was a little confused. So, and he's the one getting the revelation, right? So it's okay if we're a little confused about some things along the way too. So let's just talk about the outline then. In, in Revelation 119, Jesus says to John, therefore... Write what you have seen, what is, and what will take place after this. Those are important words. And most theologians will say this one verse right here is the outline for the entire book. And, and as you, on your outline, I've, I've really, um, I, I turned to Dr. Warren Worsby's work on Revelation, great, great resource. Um, there's some resource. If you want to read more and read about, uh, and I've got some good resources I can point you to. Uh, Warren Worsby's book on Revelation called Be Victorious in his B series. Are, are any of you familiar with Warren Worsby? Oh, you need to be. You need to get your, if you want to read some, some commentary, you want to dig into any you know, book of the Bible, especially the New Testament, uh, Worsby's books, he had a series called B, the B series, B-E, not the letter B, but like in this case, Be Victorious. Um, so the, the, the subtitle of Be Victorious says, you are an overcomer because of Christ's sure and glorious return. And that's the title of the book. And so he gives this outline uh, based on verse 19 of the entire book of Revelation. So number one, the outline will look like this. It's the things which thou hast seen. And of course, he's quoting from the, the King James in that particular text. The things which thou hast seen. And so that is John's vision of the exalted Christ. What he has seen is what he's about to write about right here in in chapter 1. And then he says, the things which are. Number two, the things which are. And that's going to be just two chapters, chapters 2 and 3, on the seven churches of Asia Minor. The things which are, because John was a pastor, an apostle, but also a preacher and pastor in Ephesus. Paul had started that church, and it had grown. And later, John comes, and and he ministered. Timothy had ministered there. Apollos had ministered. Ephesus was an important part uh, of the first century church. And after the destruction of Jerusalem in 70, And the diaspora, the the spreading out of the disciples all across um, the world from the Roman Empire from there, uh, Ephesus became a really important hub for Christianity. And so one of the seven churches, the first of the seven churches, is going to be Ephesus. Imagine that. So we'll talk about Ephesus when we get there uh, in chapter 2. But chapters 2 and 3 are the things which are what's going on right now In your world, John, there's some things going on in your world. I want you to write about them. I want you to write my message to the seven churches. And that's what that's going to be in chapters 2 and 3. And so that leaves a whole big chunk of the book of Revelation to fall into the third category. The things which shall be hereafter. 
or after these things, as some translations have it. So from chapter 4 all the way to the end of the book, chapter 22, is everything else. And so Worsby divides it out in this way. He says chapters 4 and 5 are all about um, the, the throne of heaven. Uh, chapters 6 through 19 is all about the tribulation. There's three parts to the tribulation. There's the first half, the middle, and the second half. And it's broken out in those three, in those, by those chapters. First half of the tribulation, chapters 6 through 9. Middle part of the tri tribulation, chapters 10 through 14. The final two and a half years of the tribulation is chapters 15 through 19. And then that's followed by the millennial kingdom of Christ in chapter 20 in the second coming. And then chapter 21, 22, the new heavens and new earth. So that's how it's going to, to break out. In the form of an outline. Now, here's what we want to do. I want to read the text, and then we're going to uh, we're going to begin to touch on some of these. We won't get through all of this today. We're going to touch on some of these. The revelation of Jesus Christ that God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John who testified to the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ, whatever he saw. Verse 3 says, Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. I will, I will receive that blessing, Lord, and I'm reading it aloud even now. And blessed are those who hear the words of this prophecy. So blessing be upon you for hearing these words. But that's not all. And keep. That means obey, do, abide by, apply these things. What is written in it because the time is near. Verse 4 says, John, to the seven churches of Asia, grace and peace to you from the one who is, who was, and who is to come, and from the seven spirits before the throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, the ruler of the kings of the earth. To him who loves us and has set us free from our sin by his blood and made us a kingdom, priest to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Look. He is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. So it is to be. Amen. I'm the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, the one who is, who was, and who is to come. And I'm going to stop right there um, because I just want to point out a few things, and, um, and this won't take but, but just a couple of minutes. So I want you to follow with me in your outline. This is introduction and a salutation from John to those that he's writing to, the, the seven churches. And to all of us, we're talking about what seven churches means also. So, under introduction, number one. You got that ready, Wesley? Introduction number, there we go. So, the subject matter. What is Revelation about? What is, what is the subject? It is the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's not the revelation of St. John as some scribe you know put a title on the book however many years ago that's not it at all. it's the revelation of jesus christ he's the subject it's all about him everything is about jesus and that's got to be the the uh, the highlight of everything that we do from chapter one through chapter 22 we're highlighting jesus christ and so, um, the, the word revelation, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, is a translation of the Greek word apocalypsis, which we get apocalypse from. 
and it means to uncover, unveil, or reveal. That's why it's called revelation, the revealing of something. And so it, it, the, the word apocalypse, we think of some big explosion and the end of all things. Well, that's not really what the word means. The word means to reveal what has in the, up to this point been hidden or veiled and unveiling, if you will, is another way to translate that word, to unveil. Um, and so the subject is Jesus Christ. The source, according to verse 1, this is the revelation of Jesus Christ that God gave him. So the source of the revelation is God himself. In John 15, 15, Jesus talks to his disciples and, and he tells them that, listen, I want to reveal everything to you. Everything the Father's given to me, I just, I want to give to you. All that, that, that God is, 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 God the Father is revealing, I want to teach you. I want you to know about the kingdom of God. I want you to know these things. And so still Jesus is doing the same thing here, right? I want you to know about these things. And God is revealing um, uh, this, this revelation that John is, is about to experience. What is the objective? Number three, the objective. Again, in chapter one, it tells us what the objective is. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ, subject, that God is the source. God gave it to him. And what's the purpose or the objective? To show his servants. Show his servants. Okay, now what is the message? Number four, the message. What, is, what does God want to show through Jesus and, and through John? What does God want to show? Well, again, the end of verse one says, what must soon take place. When we talk about that word soon, <clears throat> How long has it been now? A couple thousand years. <laughs> you know. How soon is soon, Lord? <laughs> you know, some people asked, some people were complained about that, and Peter addressed that in 2 Peter chapter 3. It's listed in your outline here, 2 Peter chapter 3. But let me summarize that for you in that text. Peter says, listen, there are a lot of folks that are scoffing at God where's this second coming you've been talking about? And what does Peter say about that? He says, listen, you really could squat scoffing at God and realize that God's delay is to your benefit. If God comes today, or if he came yesterday, you're in trouble, buddy, because you don't know him. And, and you're not going to like the consequences of that. So, so Peter says, in, in summary, he says, it's, it's, it's out of God's patience and his desire that all would come to repentance. That all would come to faith in Jesus. Now, not, all, not every one will, but he says that's God's desire. And that's part of the reason why he hasn't come yet. Jesus hasn't come because... He, he's still holding out for some of you to get saved. And that's a good thing for you, but it's going to be a bad thing if he does come and you're not yet. Because then he goes on to describe what it's going to be like when, he, when all the end of this does happen. He says that the earth is going to be destroyed. It's going to be, first it was destroyed by water. Remember the flood? Next it's going to be destroyed by fire. The elements of the earth are going to be in, in, in flames. Well, guess what? The book of Revelation gives us some of the details of that or a little bit of that. and says, yes, that's what's going to happen because God's going to create a new heaven and a new earth. And those who belong to him are not going to have a problem with that destruction because we're going to be with him. So, um, so the soon in, in verse 1 has more to do with the rapidity of something once it happens. Does that make sense? It's kind of like when the dominoes fall. 
have you ever lined up, you know, or play with those dominoes? You set them all in a big line, and you make this little trail. And you're like, this is going to be so cool when the when the do-. now you can you can take your time setting all that up. It may take a little while. Have you ever seen some of those that just like go all over an entire building, thousands and thousands of dominoes? It must have taken hours and hours, maybe even days, to set some of those up. But once that first domino falls, what happens? The rapidity. How rapid it's going to. The soon is, that's the heart of this particular Greek word. Once it starts, it is going to start. It's going to be rapid. It's going to be quickly. And so that, that's the heart behind that particular word. Again, you know, Peter says in that text in 2 Peter chapter 3, to God, a day is a thousand years, a thousand years as a day. Remember that? So that's, you know, God is setting all of this up. The pieces of the puzzle, the, the dominoes are, are being, you know, everything's getting laid out. And, and whenever that last domino, and some of us talk about it in terms of, of salvation. Whenever the last human being on planet earth that, that God knows is going to be saved is going to get saved, that's when that domino falls. Jesus is going to, going to rapture the, the church and all of this is going to begin. So, um, so the message, the, the objective is to show his servants. Uh, the message is that all of this is about to take place soon. And so, you know, we talk about time versus eternity. We live in time. God, does, God is not limited by time. We are. In fact, my time is pretty much spent tonight. So we're going to end on this. So we're limited by time and space. God is not. God's the creator of time and space. To wrap my mind around that, sometimes I talk about looking at, you remember when we, when we used to study history? In our history books, there would be a timeline. You remember those? And it would give, this event happened here, and then this, and then this, and then this. And you could look at it on a page as if you're standing out over time and you can look down upon it. You didn't live there or there or there or there. You're living in the moment you're in. It's a history book, but you're kind of looking over time. God is like that in eternity over time. He is always in every space at all times. That's why from the beginning to the end is all the same to him. That's why he's Alpha and Omega, beginning and the end. He's in every moment along the way at the same time. So time, time, time is not um, limiting to God. But he works within the, the, the way he created uh, this universe to work in, within time. And, and he has events lined up and, and things that, that he's doing. Uh, in order to bring about the, the redemption that we've talked about. So that being said, um, we made it all the way through verse 1. So actually we didn't even make it all the way through verse 1, did we? We made it halfway through verse 1. <laughs> but here's what I do, I promise. Next week, we're going to cover all the rest of chapter 1. Okay, because a lot of this is preliminary tonight. Next week, we can really dive in a little deeper and, uh, and, and touch on all these other things that are so important to us. Um, any, any questions? I know. Um, not, a lot to, not a lot to question so far. We only made it through half a verse. <laughs> All right. Well, listen. While uh, while we're we're being dismissed, um, brother William, will you say a prayer for us tonight as we're dismissed? <clears throat>